Welcome everybody. Thank you very much for joining this webinar. I am Lenneke Knoop. I'm from the Water Channel. And before handing things over to the speaker, I would like to uh, share some practicalities with you. We have two speakers today, and the setup of today will be as presented on the screen. Um, and as you can see, after the presentations, there is some room for questions and answers. Now you can ask uh, questions the whole session long by using the chat box in the right bottom corner. I will compile them during the webinar and then we will ask them after the presentations to one of the speakers. And um, I would also like to encourage you to use the chat box to write down your name, your organization and the country so that we have a sense of who is in this webinar room. Furthermore, I would like to mention that this webinar is organized under the Rain for Food program which has a very, very active community of which I already saw uh, quite some people online. And um, this community shares experiences on rainwater harvesting technologies. And I, yeah, you are very much invited to join the community through the link that is presented all the way in the bottom of your screen, the D groups link. So today's webinar is about crisis, water and refugees. And to be honest, I don't think it needs uh, much of an introduction as the numbers we all see daily in the newspapers are overwhelming. Um, refugee camps are emerging at places where the natural resources are scarce or due to the enormous amounts of people living at refugee camps, the pressure on local resources is very high. And with this webinar, we want to share some of the experiences experiences on crisis situations and water supply, like what are the main challenges that we are facing and what are the opportunities at hand. Now the first uh, presenter is Harm Bouter from Zoan. Zoa will present some of his experiences when he was working in Sudan Darfur. And the second speaker, Rania Alzobi from Mercy Corps, will share her experiences in setting up a water supply infrastructure around the Zatari refugee camp in Jordan. Now let's not wait any longer. And with this, I would like to hand over to Haram. I will put up the presentation. Haram, the floor is yours. Okay, yep. Good morning, everybody. Welcome uh, to this webinar. Um, I'm currently, my name is Harm Balta, I'm currently working with ZOA, uh, a Dutch NGO working in uh, many conflict uh, related settings. Um, the experience I'm telling about though, about Sudan, Darfur refugee camps is mainly linked though to my experience with a, a Swiss organization called MedAir, who has been working uh, for many years in uh, Sudan. Um, amongst that in um, refugee camps and IDP camps in Darfur. Um, the area I will be talking about is, oh, let me see. Yeah. will be Western Darfur. The map is not fully updated, I see, because by now there are five Darfurs at this time. But the area I'm talking about is the border area of Western Darfur near the town of El Janina. Um, I will be careful uh, not to give a, a complete overview of the Darfur situation as it even got more complex, I think, over the years. But um, one of the reasons it initially started in 2003 was partly because of uh, a political neglect of the area by the Khartoum uh, ruling party, which might have triggered off uh, a lot of conflict in the area. Um, the initial years might have been relatively clear who all warring parties were, but actually over time uh, it has gotten more and more complex with many different parties, many fractions of rebel groups fighting, uh, intertribal fighting, and also the causes of the fighting have been extremely diverse, um, where it start, might have been linked to political power, uh, Neglect, also issues of land, uh, land resources, water, uh, more recently even gold, have come up, leading to massive displacements. 
the peak of the displacement have been like in 2003, but actually over the years it has gone up and, and down and even the most yeah, last year and even currently, there are still very frequent uh, displacement of people. Maybe a little bit in some other areas, as you can see, more in the northern Darfur area, parts of southern Darfur, where um, a lot of displacement still is taking place. Um, Medair has been working in the area actually before 2003 on a medical program. But then in 2003 itself, when the, the, the crisis fully erupted and the, the massive displacement was there, uh, it started off with an emergency wash program. And, oh, oh, sorry. Um, yeah. Which area I'm talking about is uh, a camp, Ardamata and Durti, two camps just outside of El Genina. That was regional capital where well, 30 plus thousand people uh, gathered quite in a short time frame and matter initially started off with a emergency response where we had to provide a water for an enormous amount of people um, and what well, one of the pictures you see here is indeed a, a big water tower system matter has built together with uh, local government. It's a system that has been used a lot in the towns itself very often and in some remote rural areas. Um, providing, or this is a big system, 100 cube meters, uh, which has been filled up twice a day, providing for about 30,000 people water that was chlorinated and then distributed through system in the camp where uh, a lot of the IDPs in this case could, could take their water during open times. In addition there were existing hand pumps in the area and there have been hand dug wells that have been upgraded through um, through the work of Medair and of course other NGOs. Um, we've worked with a, a it, it was quite a complete program, and I think, as I said, it started off as an emergency response in 2003. So there was a big part on the water supply. There was a big part on uh, sanitation, emergency sanitation. Later on, shared the trains for, for several households, hygiene promotion, um, and different ways of water supply. So we had the massive systems. Uh, being built, providing huge amounts of people with water. We had solar systems, the oxygen tanks uh, set up, connected to drilled boreholes, uh, provided water through uh, tap stands as well, at several times during the day. All these systems were motorized, uh, so costly in many ways, by time and money involved um, and even on a smaller scale we have used some lower tech uh, technology like uh, jetting especially in the wadi areas where it was quite easy and cheap to drill uh, relatively shallow uh, boreholes but still motorized actually to pump it up to a, a tank where it gets chlorinated and distributed. As I said, it started in 2003, this work. Um, as people know, some of these camps are still there. So we're 12 years down the line. I have to say, Medair exited actually from the area in 2012. That so was nine years later. But I think until 2010, most of the infrastructure I just presented was still there. Most of the approach that had been used was still very much uh, an emergency response uh, highly cost only in, in, in the late stage of the project we 
as an organization started thinking and, and discussing more in depth, I think, with the government as well on, on how to deal uh, with the situation. Uh, I think a lot of the work initially starts, it's a camp, you hope it's temporarily, you hope people will return. Um, but I think right now, and then probably many other locations around the world, we know that's not always happening. So there's a bit of a mismatch maybe between the initial approach and as we as an organization, I think, also felt getting stuck almost in a certain situation where it's quite a challenge um, getting out of it. What you see here is an adaptation of one of the mini watt yards we made more towards the end of the project because as we found out as an NGO uh, partly under government pressure we were providing water for free but a lot of people were actually using it for other reasons here you see well in this case there are smaller children getting the water but they're collecting quite a lot of water and actually what's happening is they're selling it in the camp so they make money out of it um, it was being used for other kind of uh, uh, income generating activities, which in itself is quite a nice thing, of course, but was uh, a challenge for the sustainability of the work as well, as we were continuously pouring money into the operation and maintenance while people were actually making money out of the system. And so at some point, we made some adaptations here, which we called the donkey filling station or the donkey bag filling station where people had to pay a small amount of money to, to collect water and I think it was still a relatively uh, a low amount of money but at least we could start some kind of a financial uh, uh, repayment of the whole system because I think it's always difficult to really fully make a statement on whether people will stay or leave but in this case of the two camps it was directly outside of uh, um, the, the regional capital and we felt very much that this at a certain point could be approached as almost an urban extension people were staying there houses were getting improved a lot uh, people were starting businesses um, a lot of interaction with the town itself you, you could almost see it as a as an urban extension and to us that really also changed uh, our approach. Um, let me sorry, go back a bit. So in those last few years, we really wanted to increase the, or we wanted to withdraw in a way, I think, as an organization, because we saw other emergencies happening in the region, but we couldn't fully respond to it anymore because we were almost so stuck in this massive intervention. In, in, in many camps which were pretty well served especially compared to many other uh, areas in the in the area um, so we started lots of negotiations discussions with the government and I think that was where quite a few of our challenges were as well I'll put up a few here which I at least experienced very much in in, uh, in the Darfur setting that while we started off water supply, of course, from an emergency need, we um, uh, we wanted to have a higher involvement, I think, from the population at a certain point. But at the same time, we felt there was a very strong government pressure to continuously maintain and operate the systems, especially the camps were seen, I think, by a lot of people. There were high needs, but to actively involve what the user committee, for example, was quite a challenge because as soon as something would break down, the water community would push uh, the government, the government would push us, and, and it was very difficult to actually say no, but it's the responsibility of a, of a water user committee. Um, as, as it was close to an urban city center, maybe in that sense the government was very much on it as well. It was very easy for them to, to uh, observe. Um, but the discussions with them on, on were quite a challenge on whether this was an urban extension and we felt the government should start playing a bigger role and start including it in their urban services, whether the, the government stands for a long time had been. Now the people will return. Well, in reality, uh, I think it was doubtful. 
so I think there's a big challenge in a lot of the, especially the camps near to urban cities, where at a certain point you make a distinction: where is this actually a process of ongoing urbanization, and you should start slowly start moving the whole project, or maybe from the initial stages already to see it as an urban extension, and really think through the role of the uh, IDP community. I think in the operation and maintenance, we in the rural areas, the, the, the water use committees work slightly better, but in the camps, it felt a bit, we set it up, but the reality, the day-to-day -day reality was that the, the NGOs are very much involved in it. Uh, another challenge was indeed multiple, especially if the camps get really, really big, uh, there are multiple NGOs involved, um, initially with different approaches to, to either water, to sanitation, to households. Um, which makes the, the coordination quite difficult. I have to say that over the years that, that, that improved quite a bit. Uh, we collaborated quite a bit with the CRS, for example, on drawing a bit more one stance on how to deal with latrines. We, we, we ended up replacing latrines every two years. Um, and at a certain point we felt, we or we didn't have the money actually or either for all the latrines uh, to be done. People were actually getting some kind of income um, and we felt like we, we shouldn't do it all together or we shouldn't replace everything and we collaborated well with CRS to uh, together discuss this also with the government and see that we really could focus on the most vulnerable um, people which would free us up as well as an organization to be able to respond more to other emergencies in the area, which were in some aspects worse, I think, than, than, than the setting in the camps. Uh, a cha challenge, probably especially in border areas, which might relate to the Middle East as well, is the slight difference used between IDP camps and refugee camps, uh, where the refugee camps were managed by UNHCR, which use different standards on water supply uh, than we were using according to sphere standards for the IDP camps. So you, you've got differences between camps. Um, so I think that's on the, on the, so some of the things, I think some of the challenges we experience in IDP camps near urban areas, and which is probably something we'll see more more in other regions and maybe even more in the Middle East, it is like how to relate this uh, these camps to, to the urban settings, what's possible uh, there, um, and the collaboration of course, and I think over the years it has increased more between the NGOs, also in discussion with the government, because there might be some nice policies on how things should work in theory, the reality is in the, most of the camps we we know will be there for 10 plus years, so we, we can't continuously do this, this, this non-stop money and time input. Um, so this is a bit of an example from Darfur, and as I said, it's still ongoing. Uh, by the time Heather uh, exited from the area, we we'd spent quite some time on handing over some of uh, our work, which was a challenge in itself. And, Okay, we all know we probably might start work with the exit in mind, but the reality is sometimes different. Um, there were some surprises in other areas where we actually had built uh, a big water system. The government was actually extremely willing to take it over because I think in some ways they saw they could actually gain money from it, which struck us a bit by surprise that we had waited with that for many years. So I think in our mindset, we could have, yeah, really early on started to look for ways to, to engage local government to try to hand over things also as an emergency organization to remain somewhat flexible and especially in the urban IDP camps or just outside of urban settings that's where the government often is present has capacity those are ways like um, they can play a, a bigger role than they did thus far while especially in the rural areas um, they did not always go there it was difficult to go there we could have freed up our capacity. So that's a bit of a picture of uh, my experience in uh, in Darfur. Thank you very much. 
thank you, Harm, for your presentation. I would like to uh, directly continue with the presentation of Rania, who will share her experiences in Jordan. Rania, you can activate your mic and camera. Yeah, hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Hello? Hi, everyone. Hello. Okay. I can hear so you very well. I think the rest can also hear you. Yeah. Okay, good. So, uh, I'm Rania Zabi from Mercy Corps International in Jordan. Uh, we have different projects um, in um, responding to crisis and others for development projects. Now, uh, I will talk a little bit about uh, our experience with uh, uh, the handling the crisis of uh, the influx of refugee crisis in Jordan, uh, especially in the last five years. So I'm talking about uh, the experience of USAID project, community-based initiative for water demand management, and how we work through that. Uh, just let me give you a quick brief about Mercy Corps. Mercy Corps uh, is an international organization that is located in more than 45 countries. We work in different projects responding to natural and human-made disasters. And we work also in development focusing on different areas. One of them is water and energy management. Uh, we started operating in Jordan since 2002. Uh, we uh, are implementing this project from 2006. And actually, we're closing that, that this year, nine years project. Uh, now, community-based initiative for water demand management was basically a structure to reduce social and economic impact of water resources limitation in rural settings in Jordan. But due to the external stresses and adding demand for the resources, the scarce resource, we have to, we had it to uh, increase our work and outreach and focus on the areas that affected most by the um, Syrian uh, uh, refuge. Uh, I will give some quick uh, information about Jordan, maybe for the people who do not.
situation. One of the most uh, uh, poor countries in most. resources. Uh, the population is around uh, 6.9 million now. Uh, the total refugee numbers, Syrian refugees only in the last five years is more than is more than uh, um, 1.6 million. Uh, 600 of them is in camps in registered camps and the others are in host communities especially focused on the north area of Jordan. Uh, Jordan uh, exceeds uh, Jordan uh, water equation. Supply is much less than the demand. Uh, there is a deficit that is nearly 300 uh, thousand million cubic meter. Uh, and that is compensated by over extract extracting from the groundwater. Uh, we extracted over the safe yield 200% of the resources each year. So there is a, a severe crisis here. In our project, we thought of, uh, we worked on rural communities working with local um, NGOs to increase uh, uh, adoption and using of water use efficiency or water demand management projects through the local uh, CBOs or community based organization. We work with 175 all over Jordan. From the beginning, we started with 120 and expand to the north and focus that on the last two years. 
we worked also with the community to build their resources in or uh, capacity in managing uh, resources such water and energy thinking bigger than uh, water demand management and in the uh, again for quick response and getting more water to the areas that is affected by the Syrian refugees we added um, some water supply uh, components so that we diffuse some of the tension raised from the local community toward scarce of resources it is a chronic problem but the demand exceeded by at least 20 percent in some areas or more especially in the northern part of Jordan. What, what we are aiming or uh, seeking to achieve is increase the quantity and quality of water in rural settings, in rural Jordan, increase water use efficiency at the households using better water and in small farms level. We focus on Jordanian, but with the crisis of the Syrian, it is kind of mitigating uh, some of the uh, over demand on the uh, resources at the household and small level in this uh, part increasing awareness capacity and involvement of community leaders and end users in the water in managing water their voices is very important especially when uh, there is some uh, resentment towards government and even see, uh, refugees that it is very limited resource and how we can deal with the water and share it especially if there is a different behavioral pattern between the two countries. Jordanian are used to more scarce situation, Syrian have more resources, so it's a different even behavioral uh, thinking. Uh, and we aimed from some of the activities or projects to provide the replicable successful cases in communal water and energy renewable energy resource management. Now here is the map where uh, we work. Uh, there is a uh, if you can look at uh, this is the map of Jordan we from the north is Syria Israel Iraq from the east and from south there is uh, uh, Saudi Arabia uh, we work all over Jordan we started from the beginning then we focused you can see the density in the north because that's the most affected area by Syrian refugees Uh, how we wanted to, uh, to uh, reach the impact that we did, we designed it through three major activities, big activities. Uh, we provided 175 grants to establish revolving loan fund and uh, uh, local CBOs through competitive uh, uh, procedures. Uh, they have to compete to, to uh, show the need and the press on the community, and that's responding to longer uh, issues on water uh, availability. Uh, water harvesting is the biggest uh, uh, or have the largest uh, demand from the community to establish. Uh, we also worked at the communal projects more uh, of uh, uh, help in the community such in schools, public areas, uh, big water harvesting ponds in the bad year to be used for different uses. Uh, 257 grants to implement around uh, 300 uh, uh, projects. We'll talk a little bit about it after. Uh, improve water supply in targeted communities of northern Jordan. I talked about something that manages water in the north to, to increase the supply by rehabilitating some of the uh, uh, wells to provide for the network rehabilitation to some of the network and some of the pump stations in a value of 10 million US dollars. Uh, the achievements uh, for the first one, we give 193 grants for the CBO to establish a loving loan. Average size of it is 20,000 US dollars to give loans for beneficiaries to start projects. The total funding for this part is 4.6 million. Um, then now from the revolving loan, 11,000 loan were given or project started or funded. 25% uh, of the borrowers are from women. The direct beneficiaries or the households is uh, 
61,000. The repayment rate for the through the nine years, the whole CBOs is 93%, and it's impressive because it's not exactly microfinance uh, work. Now, the money itself was turned over twice, like the amount of money given is uh, money, uh, the value of projects implemented through the nine years is over, uh, is around 15,000 US dollars. So it was turned uh, in, uh, twice, and twice and a half. Over 1 million cubic meter was harvested to be used directly in the household or the small farm level. Uh, this money is, uh, there's no operating cost. It is renewed yearly. 1.5, it, it is filled 1.5 every year. Now, if you can see here the chart, the distribution or types of the small level, the 11,000 projects, you can see more than half of these projects are water harvesting systems, around 6,000. Um, uh, these are used to uh, add additional water for the household to be used in the sanitation, domestic use, and some gardening or agricultural activities in the garden to increase the capacity. The others are also related, but it's different kind, like the irrigation, small amount, and re renovating the network in the household. Now, that is for longer term uh, interventions, the water harvesting. Uh, the other type, the second, is a more communal project. It's benefiting the direct pressure, uh, short term uh, intervention, so that there will be more available. As I said, the focus of the uh, refugees was in the host communities and using the um, public services, such as clinics, mosques, and especially schools. Uh, in many schools, we uh, noticed uh, from 5 to 50 percent of the students uh, become Syrian, like it doubled its size from the uh, students and it uh, created additional pressure on the water availability in that school. So uh, community-based initiatives or community-based uh, organizations suggested many uh, activities to be implemented through them or in collaboration with the uh, local services providers uh, to increase uh, uh, the water availability in these places and decrease the tension between the students and the pressure on the schools and other service areas. Uh, so through the project till now, in two years, we implemented 186 with participation or uh, in partnership with the local CBOs, 186 water, water harvesting uh, systems in 186 schools. It, the capacity is between six 60 cubic meters to 100 based on the rainfall and the area that uh, is and rehabilitated the uh, drinking water areas uh, using water saving devices and some awareness activities. The water efficiency uh, project also worked on schools, water harvesting systems, rainwater harvesting, and new faucets and water saving devices. In two churches, churches and 12 clinics. Uh, the pattern of the users of these uh, service areas uh, is uh, fluctuating, especially for the senior refugees. Some schools have doubled, as I said, and some of them have two uh, time periods. So there is a real need in there. Four springs and agricultural canal rehabilitation and eight communal water harvesting uh, ponds were also uh, used. They use it, these large ponds in the Badi area or the desert to, uh, for uh, sheep drinking, for some smaller activities, uh, agricultural activities, and other uses. So it, the, the whole community will benefit from this uh, activities. Now, with the Syrian refugees crisis, there was uh, 
pressure on different levels. The resentment went to mostly to the government institutions, more than the Syrian, uh, more than refugees themselves, as we looked at the poor, uh, I won't say poor uh, performance uh, from the government, but that perception is that there is a poor uh, performance uh, indicator. Uh, but uh, um, we looked at how to deal with that through the project in four uh, major areas. The first one is focusing on the community outreach, talking and encouraging with the people to use water more efficiently, targeting different groups. Uh, also, through the communal projects, we were talking about how we can add more uh, uh, water to to the system, especially this is a short term or quick impact project. We need a, now a longer term. Uh, the crisis is getting longer and longer. We started with one year, two years. Now it's over five and a half years, and there's no uh, future. Uh, 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 there's no solution in the near future. Uh, we work also with the supply water infrastructure with the Armouk Water Company to increase the supply and looking other, for other resources to, to, do, to do so. But it is, again, limited. To, uh, so we need to be innovative, for, innovative in, in long-term uh, management. The tension release uh, is an important part of what is needed now, because it's building up, especially for the government. So we are trying to, to uh, identify some leaders that can discuss issues and the pressures, especially the water, energy, and education is the most pressure points or triggers of tension in the community. Uh, now, with the infrastructure, with the Armouk Water Company, the uh, potable water company in the north, uh, we worked, there is many issues that they face, so we worked in different levels. Uh, some of the issues are the population increase in the the governorate that the Yarmouk Water Company work in increased by 20% at least. Uh, the water car, uh, per capita decreased. It is already scarce. Uh, it is maximum uh, 140 national uh, number, 140 uh, cubic meter uh, per capita per year. Now it's it's dropping. Uh, from that, uh, uh, there is a, another indicator that was very important. In 2011, in the uh, baseline uh, survey, there was 16,000 complaints for the company on, on their services. It tripled in, in just two years, and now, now it's much more. It's 60,000, around 60,000 uh, complaints. There is a, an additional 30. 30,000 perception only last year to the services of the company. Uh, and Yarmouk Water Company in itself, in its capacity, is not able to respond to this pressure, uh, taking into consideration the limited uh, technical, uh, human resource, and financial resources to respond. Now, what we worked with through the small project is to respond to some of the, these issues through uh, multiple uh, layers. One of them is increase the infrastructure work, uh, the rehabilitation, and uh, uh, in, uh, connecting new wells to the network. The second is more providing material and uh, equipment for the emergency team for the company. And the third, we work on the outreach and talking to people how to use better efficiently and how to uh, get additional resources of water through water harvesting, especially. Uh, outreach and how water uh, Yermuk company can communicate communicate better with the with their uh, recipients, and that, that is a very important uh, issue, especially in in crisis time. Uh, I will give now a small one example of one area that we work in, one of the CBOs in one village. Uh, and uh, 
how that affected their work. Uh, her job village is in the north near the Syrian border. The initially it is populated by 7,000 people. 2,500 Syrian refugees came to the uh, area in, in, in 2011-12. Uh, they get a grant, the CBO, to start a revolving loan fund. Actually, this is a bit old number. These, uh, this case is uh, what made early this year, but now it's 30 households benefited from the project. Water, they harvested each household harvest 330 cubic meter at least. Uh, that's one term. So in average, they have accumulatively uh, this year till this year, it's more. It's around 900 cubic meters for use in the household. It can it benefit uh, around 30 uh, families uh, with their guests, Syrian guests. They reside either as a guest in the, their uh, relatives' uh, houses or rent some houses in the in the village. Uh, the communal projects in, in places there is two water harvesting systems and two schools. The in these schools there is now 860 students. 80% of them are Syrian. Uh, in addition to uh, uh, providing uh, uh, infrastructure or the water harvesting itself technique, awareness, raise, uh, awareness raising campaigns and fun activities was done between the kids.
appreciate more the water and have a space to to play and to understand and to communicate in a friendly um, atmosphere around the water issue so uh, tension was released now this is one of the activities This is the water harvesting system uh, that was uh, implemented and have the, we had a campaign with the kids to print their um, handprint on the uh, system itself and call it for all of us campaign that water is very valuable and we should appreciate it. It's part of ownership, understanding that there is alternatives of, ha of having water resources and uh, it can be fun and it, it should be uh, part of our daily uh, thinking. A uh, woman is very important in this uh, 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 equation, also uh, youth. Uh, there was different activities and discuss discussion with uh, gender uh, uh, population um, group, community groups in the villages. A uh, woman is not vulnerable all the time, or uh, as you know that, it is uh, it's different in the water situation. Water resources is scarce for everyone, but sometimes there is different messages need to be delivered or different mechanisms of thought, discussion and understanding the issues. So we work through the schools, uh, CBOs and the community to understand different needs of the for for uses. Uh, we worked with them on different levels and, uh, for example, some of the indicators that we use is uh, how many CBOs are dominated or managed by women. You can see it's 27% of our network is totally women CBOs. Uh, percent of women on the managed loan, uh, loan management committee for the revolving loan, it should be at least 25% so that they can uh, have a decision-making uh, uh, tool to be uh, used in, in, in selecting beneficiaries. Um, the, there was a lot of uh, technical and uh, uh, management training. 20% uh, of the, the trainees were women. Uh, and this is very interesting uh, indicator. The, the next one is uh, loan uh, takers. Uh, 23 percent of the um, loans were taken by women but the, and that's uh, an improvement on the community as mostly men is the decision makers for especially um, financial resources so that's uh, that's interesting and need to be studied uh, the causes and uh, is it good or not we need to understand more that situation and uh, overall uh, who benefited from the revolving loan or especially water harvesting is uh, uh, as you see 27,000 uh, women the half of the population that is targeting everyone now thank you for listening and uh, Sorry, it was quickly uh, arranged. Uh, if you have any question, I can answer uh, directly. And thank you. Anika? Thank you very much, Irania. And thank you, thank you Harm, Irania. also thank you for, your for your presentations. I can hear an echo. Irania, could you maybe no, uh, mute your mic? Yeah. Great. Okay. There are many questions already um, coming into the chat box, so I will now post them here. In the meantime, um, uh, let me quickly reflect upon the presentations. I think it's uh, uh, great to learn more about um, the flexibility of certain systems, where Harm was talking about uh, a mismatch and actually the uh, urban extension of the camps. 
So after the implementation of the activities from the Darfur experience, they noticed that things are uh, staying much longer, while in the case of Rania, I think the whole project was set up differently, but they had to adjust due to the Syrian crisis. Now, um, it would be great if we can start by answering the questions first to Harm. Um, I hope you can all see the questions that I put up on the left side. Um, Harm. The quest, first question from Saroj, he's living in Nepal, um, asks if, um, yeah, he says the following, you indicated that working approach of different international NGOs, what is the main yeah. challenge developed, observed, or to deal with? Yeah, I think the main challenge that we initially encountered in uh, the camps were the different levels of service different NGOs were providing and especially I think when it came to the level of involvement of the, the refugees themselves where some organizations might have decided that they would do everything or other organizations would either pay a little bit to get people involved uh, other people would only or some NGOs would only provide let's say screens to a few people while others would do it to everybody. So I think there was quite a mismatch and what we felt is that it almost always fired back because there were led to constant discussions and negotiations either with the government or with the camp uh, representatives. How we dealt with it, um, like there, there was an official WASH cluster uh, coordination system in, in, in town, in the area, but I often had the impression we, we we weren't really dealing often at that level um, with it. So I felt my impression is that often actually through personal contacts with like responsible people between the different organizations over time, it took quite a bit of time, but actually coming up together, uh, discussing what would be feasible approach together uh, as in one camp at a time. I think that that's made it more feasible as well rather than coming up with one plan for West Darfur or something, we just said like, okay, these two camps outside of El Janina, we're working both here. How can we, uh, how can we improve uh, or how can we collaborate on, on one approach? And at the same time, there's a bit of a challenge and I think we, we've been lucky, uh, lucky a bit as an organization, is at least we were a bit expat heavy. Uh, the risk is that an extremely high turnover of uh, management staff in a setting like Darfur. I think we've been lucky to have people there for one or two years to actually guide those processes as well and really make those uh, contacts both with the local government levels and with the other INGOs. So, yeah, I think my main thing would be at this stage, like, not make it too big and only try one camp at a time in this setting rather than um, make it one big uh, policy. And then towards the government, I think, yeah, it took time. We'd raised the issue several, several times and I think we more and more push it forward like this is the way we have to go just also on the financial side we can't afford to do it so either the government sticks to their guns but it means we can't actually do anything or we prefer to do something but under somewhat different conditions and still targeting the most uh, needy people in the area. Yeah. I hope that gives a bit of an impression uh, to so yeah I think it does, and it also answers actually the second question that um, Sean has asked from uh, yeah, RWSM. I've, I've seen uh, the interaction between the humanitarian NGOs and the development NGOs. Uh, I can reflect a little bit on that. Uh, I think there has been uh, a change over the years in Darfur as well. The, uh, the period I'm talking about, indeed, uh, up to 2012, a lot of the work done in Darfur, Western Darfur, was a lot of emergency work. Uh, Tear Fund, though, together with uh, UNEP, had done uh, a really good research in 2007 on, indeed, the sustainability of water resources in uh, in the area. So that's definitely a much more developmental approach. Uh, um, I've over the years, and especially, well, and this time, I think it's still a mixture of, of some areas in Darfur where are still very much in kind of emergency mode camp settings while a lot of the rural areas are well, somewhat more stable and a more developmental approach is being used. Uh, a donor as uh, DFID really 
is focusing on that. I think uh, they, uh, you others uh, have spent a lot of money focusing on urban systems, especially in Miana, was mentioned that was completely, completely overstretched. Um, ZOA itself, or, or it, it's about to start. The whole plan is there, is, is starting to implement a much more uh, water basin shed level approach uh, on indeed looking at water balances in uh, a water basin and see how we can get different people together on, on, on the management of a, a small, medium sized uh, water basins. Um, which is definitely a much more longer term approach. Also, the whole political process takes much more time. In the camps itself, I don't think that that view was there. And I, I don't know at this stage how, how the setting is, but I, I think there's a bit uh, the difference between the rural areas where slowly less emergency responses and need longer term responses are being implemented than in the camps itself. Yeah. No. Thank you for that. Um, another question from Jacques van Tuin. He asks, do you consider involving professional water supply organizations such as Fitens Avidas uh, International to assist in the transfer to a more permanent water supply situation? Yeah, uh, it's a very, very interesting question. Uh, I think the short answer is no, we did not consider that. Uh, um, it, yeah, it would have been interesting. I think in the bigger things like like Viala and the urban systems they, they might get more involved I think the whole security setting might have been interesting so I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking out loud like in what way they would have been involved because I think just getting people on the ground would have been nearly impossible as a, as the way to, to, to move around and, and work was very limited um, so the answer is no it, it would have been uh, interesting. I would like it would be interesting to hear a little bit more what what kind of support they could have given in in, in that as well, uh, because I think it would not have been directly on the design side of the system, maybe, uh, but more on the management side. But yeah, it would be interesting. Uh, it would be interested to hear more than from Chuck on, on what would be possible there and what kind of experience there is as well. Yeah, okay. uh, the invitation is there. And yeah. then um, another question from Robert Meerman. Um, you mentioned that the interventions are very costly, uh, um, yeah. but durable. But what other options are there, or do yeah. you know of, and perhaps cheaper options? Yeah, no, that's a, that, that's good uh, that Robert raised the point. I, I forgot to mention it. it, it, it um, I think after the years, uh, um, or we noticed the really high cost. Uh, on top of that was the really difficult situation on security-wise. Uh, well, in the initial years, we had been able to drive around by car. Uh, after 2010, that was impossible. So that for the camps that were further away from Algenina, all transport almost had to go by helicopter, which also meant you had very limited time even to, if, if something would break down, things, it would take a long, long time to repair. So we we started uh, decommissioning the, the the mini water yards like the two Oxfam tanks kind of systems when we managed to get funding for at least drilling regular boreholes with hand pumps um, and and that felt at least on the cost side and, and the intense uh, operation and maintenance that was a, a a big step forward also to get community involved more talking about like Really, other solutions in uh, in other areas in Sudan we've worked, but less emergency. We have worked indeed with half peers, which are like half a man.
to uh, seasonal rivers uh, being filled up, which is often used for a lot of cattle, um, and, and you have to come up with other kind of water uh, solutions to improve the water quality. Uh, Biosend filters in places where there is continuous water, so it could be around a half a year. Um, jetting, in a way, was was cheaper, uh, a cheap way to to drill at least and, and go to uh, around the wadis. So there was a technology that has been introduced in Darfur. I feel we have not fully explored it, and maybe partly also due to to the restrictions on movement at a certain point. But on, on, on the drilling side, it would have been a much cheaper and, and a really fast option um, to have explored. Um, so that, that would have been some of the cheaper options. I know other organizations have built, uh, I think in Adra, uh, have built like a half year in a certain area, but often that attracts a, a lot of cattle. It, it's more on that side. I'm not sure how to link that to uh, a refugee camp in itself as the, the water demand is really high as well. Thank you for the question. In the meantime, I see a uh, response to your answer um, on involving water supply companies, because Jacques yeah. mentioned, well, his question is more related to the slowly transfer to a more revenue situation. Yeah. Can you yeah. tell about that? Yeah, so I think in the, in the official policy, uh, there, there, there would have been an option to uh, to charge for water, even if it would be a very small amount. Um, and we've started in need with, as I mentioned, the, the donkey filling stations, where we saw at least there was some some money available uh, and, and money being made actually through the water. So that that's on a very small scale that we've started. On, on a complete camp level, that was uh, a bridge too far. Uh, and the, I think the government, the part of the government we were dealing with was ambivalent in that as well, because our official policy would say, uh, yes, you should be able to charge some money, but these are camps, so you can you cannot charge money. Um, so yeah. we, we we slowly try to push for it, but I agree that we we could have started earlier in the process. As I say, most of the camps will be there for a long, long time. Um, and even in some settings, and maybe even more in the Middle East, people are sometimes even used to pay a lot of money, especially when it's tankered or in other systems. So rather than stepping back from really high cost to water for free, there, there might be some options to, to, to find a middle ground where there is need some kind of cost recovery system. And, and we felt in other places, people were willing to pay for water when it was for cattle, for example. So the big towers in other parts of Sudan, people were willing to pay uh, in case of cattle. Um, we're coming to drink and they would use that money. But in the camps, that wasn't an option. Mm. Thank you. Then I would like to ask a final question to you and then we go to the questions for Rania. There's one question from Henk van Schaik. You uh, briefly touched upon it. So the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs did a lot of work in the 80s in uh, Niala and Genina, if I say that right, especially yeah. mapping groundwater resources and management, as that's, uh, well, a challenge. Is this knowledge still there, and is it also being used in the current uh, operations? Yeah. Um, I'm... I'm, I'm I know there has been quite some research done. Uh, how available that knowledge is, I, I, I don't know exactly. Uh, I think in the experience with often the local governments, you, you might sometimes be lucky to find a very old report somewhere on a shelf. So yes, the knowledge is there, but the, impl the implementation isn't necessarily there. I know there has been like here and there done quite some research in on, on indeed uh, aquifers in Darfur. But it hasn't really been brought up to the next level, I think, on really influencing uh, practice a lot. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I, maybe in Niala. I, I think on Niala as a town, there has been much more focus and they, they really have a, a, a big challenge with the, the water supply. So it might be in that area that uh, it's used. But for Janina, I'm not aware of it. Okay. Thank you. Then, um, Rania, I would like to ask you if you could uh, activate your webcam and uh, microphone. 
So we can go to the questions for you. And also thank you to the audience. So many questions. This question to Rania is um, from Saroj from Nepal. In my experience, he says it is difficult to measure resilience, or at least I find it difficult to measure it. It will be great to know. the way how mercy for, for you are able to measure community resilience what sorts of factors are considered to measure it how do you measure it that's the question Yeah. No, I I understand. Maybe. Uh... Sorry, I still hear an echo. No, I think that will answer the question, and maybe uh, Saroj can be directly in contact with you as well. And then another question, because at a certain moment in your presentation, you uh, were showing uh, numbers on the successfulness of the project, and Al Hassan Adam asks. What contributed to that figure of 93% repayment rate? Could you tell something about that? Yeah, so the question is, you were explaining about uh, the successfulness of the project. And then at a certain moment you had the slide, maybe I can just get that slide back. And the question is, what contributed to the number of the 93% repayment rate? Let's see if we can find it. Thank you for that. Another question from one of our guests is what kind of irrigation do the people use and do they have uh, additional water saving tools or methods for gardening, for example? Could you say something about that?
we can go to the question. Thank you for that. That was a clear and answer. Also thank you for now, another question is, what are the implications for water supplies? Henk van Schaik asks, is there a form of governance in the camps? And how is it connected with the government of Jordan? What about financing and operation and maintenance? I think you briefly already discussed about the influence of the government. But maybe you can um, share some more experiences on that. What sorts of factors are considered to measure it? How do you measure it? Interesting. Uh, resilience is a big word, like sustainability. What does, does that mean? It's the, what, how you define your action or what is resilience. Here we were talking in our project that we increase the ability of people to cope with water shortage. Especially, we can talk about the quantity of water, it's the tension, the complaints is one part of the indicators that we can talk about. So I think you need to identify what does it mean in, in the situation, and from there, what is the related uh, uh, activities or related thinking behind that. And from there, the indicators can be easily put. It depends in, in the situation. Yeah. No, I, I understand. Maybe. Uh... Is that? Uh, yeah. Sorry, I still need no, I think that will answer the question, and maybe uh, Sarah can be directly in contact with you as well. Yeah, sure. And then another question, because at a certain moment in your presentation, you were showing uh, numbers on the successfulness of the project. Yeah. And Al Hassan Adam asks, what contributed to the figure of 93 to 3% repayment rate? Can you say something about that? I can't see the question. Can you repeat it, please? Yeah. Can you can you repeat the question? I did not. Yeah, similar. I can't see it in front explained. of me, and I did not hear. Um, there is a question uh, yeah, related to that. You just mentioned, I think, that uh, in the camps there was a distribution of 50 liters per day. But um, Francis Okello is asking. You mentioned that the water supply yeah. by the company is 140 cubic meters, which translates to 380 liters. Per capita Actually, per day, it's, it's many and um, isn't that a lot? Um, what the is the standard it's, it's very for impressive Jordan? for us even when we talk about it. There is a demand for this kind of projects. It was not in the beginning, but the need created the, the, the demand that yeah. that there is a long waiting list in the CBO, so that they have to collect the money to give the new families. And we selected a well-established organization. It's not we we start from the beginning. But we add it for their capacity. And follow-up is very important in, in, in doing so. They, they report and we support them on the job training in, in addition to, to their uh, um, input and voluntary work. So many different reasons that led to this. Um, but the most important is the need itself, need and demand. Yep. Yeah. Thank you for that. From one of our guests, what kind of irrigation would it be used, and do they have uh, additional water savings method for gardening, for example? Yeah. Could you say something about that? Yeah. Now, uh, for irrigation, we work in, in mostly yeah. households, but some of the work was done in, in small farms uh, with small farmers. There is different uses. In Jordan, the yes. different yes. geographic and. Uh, uh, um, can you tell us what the sources of income in the refugee camps are? Hank Jordan Valley, for would example, like uh, it's all drip irrigation. Uh, farmers are well known, uh, well um, uh, informed or educated in, in the techniques, but it's there's still room for yeah. improvement. Uh, I understand. And in Highland, they use surface irrigation and drain fed. Yes, uh, we will share so the contact different. details. In the Jordan we Valley, they be in contact in directly. Replacing all and maybe another uh, question that you might know. Pipelines. Uh, Madea asks, during the winter when it snows and water freezes in many types in Jordan, how is the situation in the supplying the camps or with water? Gray water in some, some is there a different technique? Like what, what do you water. usually do? Can you tell something about that? Yeah, I hope that's Thank you for that. Now, another question is, what are the implications for water supplies? Hank and Schreit asks, is there a form of governance in the camps, and how is it connected with the government of Jordan? Yeah. About financing and operation and maintenance. I think you've really already discussed about the influence of the government. We can 
Now, I can't talk much about the refugee camps because I didn't work there. But uh, through Mercy Corps, there was um, digging new wells in the camp, in Zatri camp and Azra camp. There is two big camps in, in, in Jordan near the water resources. Now, in the beginning, it was like quick fix, you know, finding a direct uh, source of water and providing, um, at, I, I think it was 50 liters per person per day in, in, in the camps. Uh, now, after five years, it's becoming mo mo much more risky, especially for uh, sewage, the out outflow, not just that. Thank you. So the management... Um, I would uh, like to ask uh, the, two the final questions. Big, As I see, we are already running well, over 12 uh, people are leaving. Governance but um, the, the question, question for that is that I guess, which I recently discovered is Shukru from Turkey. Big, uh, he has a question to uh, you. He says, I have witnessed any... Have you witnessed for, any conflict uh, between local situation. people and Syrian These people in Jordan on what use? As you mentioned, that water scarcity is a big issue. Provide water, and it was supposed to be two or three years. Now, over five years, the the situation is getting more messy, and it's it needs longer term activities. The government is thinking of uh, water, wastewater reuse and uh, collection system for the the camps. It is it's becoming settlements actually. It's not just a refugee camp, a new city. Zaatari is yeah. is bigger than the uh, Mafraq city itself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there is a question. Which translates to 208 per capita per day. Yeah. And, um, isn't that a lot? What is the standard? I made a mistake, maybe, in, in that talk. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. It is one hundred. And the final question that I would like to ask is related to gender. And you uh, showed the slide uh, on um, gender and uh, uh, involvement of women. So Rich is asking. Now, okay, what well, I understood is that gender said, is not limited to male uh, or female. In our context, we live in Nepal. We have a caste uh, system where men from yeah, dim different castes are treated uh, differently and, and similar with women and uh, lower caste men has lower rights than women from higher castes. All over Jordan. Do not know the situation in uh, your area. In some areas, um, it's just a remark as you will focus more on women and gender is inclusion. Is um, and because of the uh, one so who, actually he suggests like uh, supply um, putting a context in the project area. Could you say something um, about that, or is this completely like, not? Like uh, they pump water in neighborhoods for one twenty-four hours. Only on uh, women inclusion. You know? So it is uh, resides in the network, and that leads to more. Corruption. It, it's it's a it's a big uh, 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 challenges that the government is facing with the new demand from the Syrian refugees. It's it's more. No, it's it's not a, a new thing. It's an, an old chronic problem. But it's in, it was increased by the the situation. The yes. other yeah. question is. Um, can you tell us what the sources of income in the refugee camps are? Uh, I can't answer that. Sorry, <laughs> I don't know. Yani, I, we don't. I personally, my project don't work in the camp. USAID is the host community project. Yeah. I, I can, if you can, you can send me, and I can send you more information. Yes, we will share the contact yeah. then you can be in contact directly. Yeah. And maybe another question you might know. Yeah. Uh, Madea asks, do maybe winter when it snows and what? In the camps, it's different than the households because it's not a network, not a pipeline network. They pump the water from the station and distribute it through trucks or through the uh, gallons or containers uh, per per camp, per tent or per uh, family. In the in the uh, in the Jordanian communities itself, it's it's um, certain areas like Amman, Erbed, and some of the highlands have. Um, I think we all agree snow. on that, and that's and why it we is, are uh, good comment to close uh, the webinar. Uh, 
I would really like to take this opportunity to thank everybody. Thank you all of our guests. Uh, I noticed that December is an extremely busy month for everybody. So um, it's great that we are all there and we could find time to join this. Thank you very much, Rania and Harm, for the presentations. I would also like to uh, share that uh, the recording and the presentations will be shared on the D groups. Uh, you will see an, a link on your screen uh, when I close the session. And also the recordings will be available on the Water Channel. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks again for joining this webinar. And we are looking forward to see you in uh, the next webinar in the new year. Thank you. Have you witnessed any?